This conference will now be recorded. All right, folks, so good morning. We are here today and going to be finishing up uh, chapter 13 regarding the uh, nervous system and then looking into uh, chapter 14, which would be the special senses. So today we are going to be discussing as far as uh, some of the interesting aspects of the anatomy of the nervous system and in, in particular of the central and peripheral nervous system. Uh, in previous, last week there, we looked at as far as, uh, minimize this for a moment here, I'm giving it, here we go. All right, so we looked at as far as the, uh, the nervous system, as far as how it, there's communication taking place. It was a little bit, I know it's a little bit challenging as far as ha having an understanding regarding what takes place as far as uh, how the communication takes place. We know that it does communicate, but how it does and, and how we have this input that comes into the nervous system, it gets processed by the central nervous system, the brain and spinal cord. And then there's some type of a response to this input and response to the processing that takes place within the brain and spinal cord. And what we did do and discuss and talk about was uh, the plasma membrane and what's going on as far as how these uh, electrical, um, we call them potentials, these, these bioelectricity that's produced, how it's produced and such. And it's a little bit, I, I, I understand uh, from a non-science major, it's a little bit kind of complex and a little bit kind of hard concept to really uh, grasp and understand. We did look at also regarding what takes, pl takes place at the neuromuscular junction, that nerve muscle junction where we actually have interaction between the nervous system communicating with the muscular system. So that muscle contraction of, in particular, we're studying the skeletal muscle. So skeletal muscle, it's the muscle that when you contract it, it moves the skeleton, simple enough. And it's voluntary control. I also made mention to you all that that the chemicals that are released here, these neurotransmitters that are released in this space, so there's not really a touching be taking place between the nerve and the muscle. There's a space there so that the chemical can be released in that space, and that chemical will then interact with specific rep receptors on the uh, on the muscle. And that area where there's an interaction between the nerve and the muscle, we call that a synapse. That's an area of communication that's taking place. And here, here we have as far as uh, looking at the different neurotransmitters and such. And so um, you see here as far as uh, dopamine and serotonin are more than likely uh, types of nerve chemicals or neurotransmitters that you've probably heard of in the past. And discussing about the nerves and the coverings of the nerves, right? And so you see here as far as this, uh, this sheath this insulation i mentioned to you regarding that uh think about the wires in your home and the electronics that you have even the electronics that i'm working on right now as far as on my computer i can see uh the different types of um insulation protecting the actual wiring that's present with inside them and that wiring that can, carries that communication that that electricity just like really the electricity is being traveled along this uh nerve and we have this, this axon in particular, this extension of the neuron, the, the nerve cell, and we have this insulation here to allow for very quick communication. So in the case of your skeletal muscle, they need to have very quick response from the brain to the musculature to contract in order as a protective function, folks. Um, and so in particular, so say um, you touch something hot, right? You touch something hot, you don't wait for your brain to think about, oh, ouch, that's hot, and then remove your hand. Right away, you touch something hot, and it there's a reflex that takes place that very quickly removes your hand and allows for contraction to take place of the musculature to remove your hand so that you don't further damage your, your fingers, your skin, as a result of the very hot object that you just touched. And so what I'd like to do is talk to you about, because I made mention of this term, multiple sclerosis, I, I talked to you about that, and I also talked to you regarding um, what's called Guillain-Barre. And so let's actually, first let's go yeah, here, here we go. Okay, so let's do this one first. So with multiple sclerosis, now it looks a little wonky. It's, it's pretty cool drawing to be honest, but like with the eyes like that, you're like, yikes, that's a little, but what the, what the artist is trying to do in order to help uh, medical students 
and, and lay people understand what's going on with this particular type of illness. And again, remember that both multiple sclerosis and Guillain-Barre are both um, autoimmune disorders, meaning that our, our own body is, for the patient, would be fighting against the structures, the, the, the cells, the tissues within it, and attacking them as if they were non-self, as if they were, were a foreign invader. And that's not a good thing. So the immune system is attacking my own tissues. It's very bad, autoimmune disease. So both of these are, disorders are. Now, in the case of, I'm just going to make this larger here, and I'll just, there we go, right there. Um, and what I'll do is I'll just show you that um, multiple sclerosis attacks the central nervous system, which is the brain and the spinal cord. The Guillain-Barre attacks the peripheral nervous system, okay? So let's look here as far as, First, we'll look at the multiple sclerosis and just see a little bit about how um, this demyelinating disorder, right? So it's demyelinating, meaning that we're taking, here we go, we're taking the myelin sheath that covers the axon, not of all neurons, but many, right? And especially those that go to the muscles that we contract, right? Allowing for quick transmission of this bioelectricity, these action potentials. Right, so this myelin sheath gets damaged. Our body is actually attacking, autoimmune, it's attacking itself. And so in the brain and the spinal cord um, would be this demyelination taking place, this removal of the insulation. So it can get damaged, it can be uh, affect the transmission of these messages going from the brain and spinal cord to the rest of the body. So in multiple sclerosis, it takes place in the brain and spinal cord. In the case of uh, the Guillain-Barre syndrome, it takes place within the peripheral nervous system, outside of the spinal cord, outside of the brain, okay, in the many nerves that are connecting the rest of the body, okay? So let's just take a look then and see as far as some of the symptoms. I'm not going to ask that you give me all of these symptoms at all, but I just want to show you how by removal of just the insulation on these axons, these extensions of the uh, the nerve cell, the neuron, how, what it can cause. It can cause issues with um, cerebellar dysfunction. So issues where we have issues with, with our speech, with our ability to stand and walk straight. So dizziness and vertigo where you're kind of, you're not steady on your feet. It can affect actually your eyes and how they can actually um, start moving on their own. It's just not a good thing, folks really can affect your sense of balance and, and equilibrium. Uh, your ability to see, it hurts when I move my eyes. You know, that's pretty crazy stuff. Uh, diplopia is a double vision, okay? Um, you'll see here as far as other types of uh, symptoms that can affect the core of the body with multiple sclerosis, um, spinal cord syndrome, where it can have weakness, numbness, and pain, um, autonomic symptoms as far as having issues with um, your the control of your digestive system and such. Um, again, these are brain and spinal cord related injuries that can affect or issues that can affect the, the, the whole uh, body and how it functions. Uh, paralysis, um, spastic paralysis is where there's there's tightening in such of the musculature and, and issues with your ability to properly walk. The cerebellar ataxia, where you're not, again, not steady on your feet and having difficulties moving around. Um, looks just some pretty uh, crazy symptoms with multiple sclerosis. And it really can be, it's a progressive illness that can have periods of time where things are really bad. And then where periods of time where things are calmed down a bit and not as, not as intense. Okay? Now, in the case of Guillain-Barre, where it affects uh, more of the uh, peripheral nervous system, not the central nervous system, the brain and spinal cord. So here in the case of peripheral nervous system, we're having issues with um, the eye muscles having a weakness, um, having palsy or is actual issues where it's difficult to even to um, speak and issues with uh, movement of your face, the facial muscle paralysis, that's, that's palsy, issues with the control. Um, Weakness as far as your ability even to swallow, um, issues with um, your heart as far as um, either your heart is going too slow or going too fast, bradycardia, tachycardia, um, issues with your blood pressure, 
um, issues actually with the actual heart muscle itself, um, digestive issues as far as uh, diarrhea or constipation or a combination of the two, which is right terrible enough, um, paresthesias and issues with like numbness and tingling that, that you can experience. And you can also experience numbness and tingling, these paresthesias with multiple sclerosis also. Um, uh, weakness paralysis of the respiratory muscles. I mean, yeah, so Guillain-Barre, and, and it can cause back pain. And so the reason why I show you this is that, so over the years, having had treated many patients with back issues, and I re can recall one patient in particular who was hospitalized as a result of leg weakness, okay, and issues with back pain, because he was really dealing with Guillain-Barre syndrome and not just an issue with, yes, he had back issues as far as spine, um, misalignment within the spine, causing pressure upon the nerves, leading to pain and discomfort, back pain, but also uh, the underlying etiology, the cause of his problems were really this Guillain-Barre syndrome. And what happens with Guillain-Barre is that it can actually, um, over time, it can actually uh, lead to, to, to a, almost full recovery or a good percentage, like a high percentage recovery, 75, 80, or 100%. I mean, it really can, you can have a full recovery from Guillain-Barre. From multiple sclerosis, the patients do not recover. So it's a progressive, slowly progressive, or it can be fast depending upon the patient and their, their illness. It can uh, be a progressive illness that leads to eventually uh, that the patient will die. Now, the patient might not die from multiple sclerosis, but from complications of multiple sclerosis, but they can eventually uh, pass away as a result. Now, this is not to say also that patients with multiple sclerosis cannot live uh, an active life, because they can, and there are different treatments that can help, but there's not treatments to cure. So multiple sclerosis, no cure. Guillain-Barre, they will, they will, they can, high percentage will get better over time. So those are just two different um, pathologies, illnesses, that can just affect what's going on with the covering of the nervous system and of these axons. Remember that the axon is the actual extension of the neuron. I wanna just give you that one more image here and then we'll move on to the new material. Yeah, so let's let's go to this image right here. And with this image right here, what you're seeing, folks, is that we have this nerve cell, right? This neuron. And here's the neuron cell body with, you'll see in the center region here, we have the nucleus containing the genetic material for this, uh, this cell. And what we have here are these dendrites, and we have an axon, right? And so the dendrites are bringing information, bringing information, sensory input to, right? It's called uh, that input is coming to that nerve cell right here from these dendrites, and then it's taking output to this axon, which will go to ner other nerves, uh, a muscle, like in the case of skeletal muscle, that neuromuscular junction, or it could be uh, to glands, right, which would release uh, hormones, chemicals that are that are going to cause some type of change in the body. And you'll see here that in this case of this axon, we have an actual um, myelination, right, that insulation. But you'll see here with this neuron and this axon, there's no myelin here, no myelin present, okay? So, but, th and that's normal. So not all of the neurons in the body have myelin, but many do. And again, many going to the skeletal muscle absolutely do to allow for um, these fast, quick communication between the neuron cell body and whatever the muscle the gland, whatever it may be, the other neuron. Okay, so oh, and here and yeah, and here is that, and we'll we'll start in just one moment here with the new stuff. So here again is that neuron cell body with the dendrites bringing information to the neuron cell body, and here's the output going through the axon to wherever it's going to communicate it with. And you see here that there are uh, myelin cells present. These are myelin. Um, insulation here. And so if this is in the central nervous system, um, we would be looking at, um, let's see here, the oligodendrocytes producing this myelin. And in the case of the peripheral nervous system, it's the Schwann cells. Not asking that you know that, but just giving you just a little bit of in additional information there. So 
let's now go to the new information for today. And we've already talked about this as far as uh, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system, but just giving you more information now, uh, new information here as far as afferent and efferent. So this is that information where the dendrites are taking information to the neuron cell body. Well, information that's coming to also to the uh, central nervous system itself, this uh, sensory input would be called afferent nerves. They're bringing signals toward the central nervous system. Efferent nerves, E-F-F-E-R-E-N-T, so don't get them confused, carry messages away from, and these would be motor output to the musculature, to the glands, right? Um, this is very important, you know, afferent and efferent regarding central nervous system and also regarding just the neurons as far as, again, that information coming to the neuron cell body would be afferent communication. The axon taking information away from the neuron cell body would be efferent. Okay. Now, as far as the peripheral nervous system is concerned, so think of this as far as that there are uh, pairs, as far as these two important structures <coughs> that we'll be talking about. As far as first the cranial nerves, these are nerves that are uh, 12 pairs of nerves that are coming directly off of the brain and then many of them going to your special senses. So in the case of cranial nerve number one would be the olfactory nerve. This is going to send information from the nasal cavity to the brain as far as for your sense of olfaction, your sense of smell, okay? That's cranial nerve number one. Cranial nerve number two would be your optic nerve. And this is the nerve that is connected directly to your eyeball itself and the sensory receptors that are present within the eye that give you input regarding uh, the world around you that you see. So giving you your sense of uh, vision, right, would be cranial nerve number two, your optic nerve. So these are paired nerves, meaning they're bilateral, they're on both sides, right and left. And these are in particular, like I said, many of them are for special senses. Now, as far as your spinal nerves are concerned, we have 31 pairs of these spinal nerves, and these are nerves that come directly off of the uh, spinal cord and are protected uh, via the spinal, the uh, the actual uh, spine itself. Okay, and they come off of the different areas where there are holes present. We call them foramen. These holes are present in order for the nerves to exit off of the spine, and they're direct extensions of the spinal cord and of uh, the, the actual um, uh, dist distal portions of the spinal cord. So you'll see here, this I put this here just so that you see afferent, efferent. Afferent information, sensory information coming to the central nervous system. This is the spinal cord. Efferent information going to, in this case, a skeletal muscle, causing some type of muscle contraction to occur, right? Um, you'll see here that there's communication here <coughs> in the spinal cord itself. This is where processing takes place and decision to be made what kind of output needs to respond to this input. So afferent, efferent. And here, this is a good image to just show you regarding um, the actual breakdown of uh, the nervous system. And realizing that it's one nervous system. Yes, there are different parts and branches of, but it's all just one nervous system. It's not that we have these separate nervous systems for the digestive system. Yes, there isn't. There is something called the enteric um, uh, nervous system, and that does deal specifically with the, the digestive system. But it's still an extension of the actual nervous system itself. So it's just a branch of. Um, when we think of these terms here, what's called somatic and autonomic. Somatic system would be the system that is actually the, the division of that motor output, that efferent, right, this motor output from the brain and spinal cord going to the skeletal muscles in particular, where we have conscious control, it's voluntary action. In the case of the autonomic nervous system, I'm going to give you a term here that I would say, and I describe it as the automatic nervous system. It's not, that's not a technical or proper term, but when we think of the autonomic nervous system, it really is automatic functions that we have no conscious control over, no voluntary control over. So in the case of your sympathetic nervous system, your parasympathetic nervous system. So these two systems right here going to the different um, 
glands, muscles, uh, the uh, organs of the body and such control in cases of in the sympathetic nervous system when you're under stress and you have a situation where there might be some type of uh, danger to you sympathetic nervous system fight or flight you probably heard that word used before that term's used um, in description of it prepares the body for action is the sympathetic nervous system the parasympathetic is when you're just doing your your life day to day and just things are just chill and it's just working to just maintain the regular body functions. But when you're under stress and there's a situation where there could be danger, sympathetic nervous system. So we call the parasympathetic nervous system that, that the one system of the nervous system that maintains a calm control and reparative functions, um, digestive functions. We, say, we call it the rest and digest branch, okay? And here you're seeing, folks, as far as we have here, um, you're, you're seeing an example of the cranial nerves. And so the cranial nerves also, also have issues with uh, control of your, your, your facial musculature, uh, the shoulder, the muscles that help to elevate your shoulders, right? Um, and flexion of your head, uh, not, now flexion of your head is not only just by the cranial nerves, but there are specific cranial nerves that there's an actual control over with, as also with the shoulder musculature, okay? Uh, as far as also um, dealing with these um, cranial, these uh, spinal nerves that come, that are protected by the spinal cord, that are, that are extensions of the spinal cord and protected by the spine itself, okay? Um, let me just show you as far as, <clears throat> Let's see here. Here we go. That's good right there. And so what we're seeing right here, folks, is that with this image, this will just give you a little bit of a better understanding. So here we can see a side view. This is a lateral view of the spine. Okay. And what we're looking at here, these are the vertebral bodies. Here we would have the intervertebral discs. And here, what is this? This is the spinal nerve, okay? And it's bilateral, it's on both sides, okay? So not only on this left side, but also on the right side. And what will happen is that by these vertebra locking, interlocking on top of each other, they create holes. And the hole that's created by the top, the one that's superior and the one that's inferior vertebra will create this hole and these spinal nerve roots will exit, will come off of and then go to and then start branching right away uh, to uh, different parts of the body in order to allow for control. Um, now, in the case of uh, what's called stenosis, so in stenosis, there are degenerative changes taking place where it actually uh, affects the actual opening, and the opening gets narrow, narrow, it gets smaller, and it can cause impingement, uh, compression of the nerve root, and this can be a problem. So that's just giving you a little bit of insight regarding um, What's taking place as far as the spine protecting the spinal cord and the spinal cord contents but you'll see here that they're paired they're on both sides and then eventually branches will go to uh, all the areas so think of the in the cervical region control of your upper extremities right upper extremities and be able to do what you can do think of the uh, lower part of your uh, spinal cord and the actual extension of this cord will have con control over the lower extremities of your legs and such. Okay. So here we have as far as uh, somatic and autonomic nerves. So we talked about the somatic nervous system, the autonomic nervous system. So when we think somatic, we think control over the skeletal muscles. So carry signals related to the movements of the different parts of your body. As far as the autonomic nervous system, so this is the automatic, right? We talked about automatic. So control over the organs and the other structures that are present throughout the body. Divided into sympathetic and parasympathetic. So divided into whether we have sympathetic control, where we have this uh, preparing the body for action in case of in times of stress, or in the case of parasympathetic, where it's more of a rest and digest, where it's more of calm type functions taking place. Okay? And both can either excite 
or inhibit. So they can either stimulate to do some action or um, inhibit so that no action takes place, okay? No response can occur as a result. So that's that. So actually, let me just, I wanna write this for you here, just coming back to this image here. So sympathetic, prepare the body for action. Please write this down if you could. Sympathetic, rest and digest. More of the calm functions of the body. So sympathetic, preparing the body for action, fight or flight, okay? Parasympathetic, rest and digest. So the reparative functions of the body, really throughout the day, you're under more of a parasympathetic uh, control than a sympathetic control, okay? Now here's the problem, here's the problem. So in today's society, and has been for quite some time, um, when you're under chronic stress, so say there's a lot of things going on at home, a lot of things going on at my job, just a lot of things in life that are creating a lot of stress for me. Um, can your body be under more of this sympathetic stimulation throughout the day than the parasympathetic where it needs to be? Because under sympathetic control, you can end up having issues with, um, yeah, no problem, Mackenzie. So having issues with, if you're under sympathetic control and under a lot of stress throughout the day, each day of the week, um, this can lead to high blood pressure, it can lead to heart issues, cardiovascular issues, digestive issues. Many parts of the body do not respond well to being under a lot of stress all the time, right? Your body's not meant to function that way. Your body's meant to, in time of need, when you're stressed, when there's a situation where you could be in danger, yes, the sympathetic nervous system sending that adrenaline. We another term we'll use is epinephrine, it's the same word by sending that adrenaline rush, that chemical that will kind of prepare you for what should I do? How do I need to respond in order to protect myself? But if you're not under some type of actual danger per se, but yet you're still responding in a stressful manner, it leads to many degenerative changes in the body as a result of being under continual sympathetic uh, response. It's not a good or healthy thing. So we need to try and do all that we can to address our stress issue in our lives. And and sometimes it, it's really difficult because of just uh, the, the environment that we live in can be very stressful and that and that's sad and that's tough. And, and, and if you're in that kind of a situation, do what you can to seek some type of intervention and help. Um, that's, that's tough stuff. All right, coming to um, what takes place as far as the brain is concerned, I, I'd like to Take a moment and back off for a moment here. Back off, Dr. Perone, right? <laughs> I would like to uh, show you, let's see here. Let's show you this image here. This is pretty interesting. So what am I showing you here? So what I'm showing you here is a brain that is not fully there. I'm showing you a brain here where we actually have one half of the cerebral hemisphere removed. And what you're looking at here is this hemispherectomy, and it's the removal of the brain as a result of, um, in particular, what's called Rasmussen's syndrome. And so a patient with Rasmussen's syndrome, let me take you here. So with Rasmussen's syndrome, so just look here, it says chronic encephalitis and epilepsy. So encephalitis is there's an inflammatory uh, process taking place within the brain, and there are seizures associated with this, okay? Uh, there also can be localized areas of um, uh, actual increase in uh, cerebral spinal fluid, the fluid that protects and flows outside of and inside of the brain, um, and there can be issues with um, actual uh, weakness on one side of the body over the other, um, intellectual disabilities. This is this Rasmussen syndrome. Now, Again, coming back to this image right here, so it's a radical surgery, but what they can do for young people is actually remove the portion of the brain that's actually, because it'll usually be focalized on one side of the brain. 
and they'll remove that part of the brain that's having these um, when, when you think of an epileptic attack, right, this epilepsy, these seizures, it's as if we know that there's electrical electricity, this bioelectricity that allows for the nerve, nerve cells, the neurons, to communicate with each other. Well, imagine if we have just like a, a, an electrical storm. You ever been outside and you, you're inside and you hear uh, uh, it's thunder and lightning taking place outside, right? So imagine an electrical storm taking place within the brain many times throughout the day. and not only just causing just this this electrical event, but a massive electrical event that causes many uh, neurons to quote unquote fire and send stimulation to the to the body, and that the body will seize and that areas of the body will contract at once when you're not really trying to control that. It's involuntary, right? Um, this can be a very difficult and challenging uh, disorder, and the only way to cure this would be it's not really managed through medication. It can be. Um, but for long-term treatment and such, really it's a matter of the hemispherectomy or partial hemispherectomy. Um, so radical surgery, yet what'll happen is that the other side of the brain will take over for duties, but there can be, um, uh, depending upon how early uh, the surgery is done for the, for the person, um, for the patient, um, there can, they can be left with different disabilities. So let me just show you as far as, oh, let me just show you one more thing also, sorry. Um, when we're looking at this image, so know that if I'm if I'm looking at it as this is the, the right side of the brain, this is the left side of the brain. So the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body, left side of the body. So the, can there be issues with control over that left side of the body? So there's something called plasticity, plas like plastic, plasticity, plasticity. I'm sorry, it's a hard one for me to pronounce. But it's it's this ability for the brain to to relearn uh, different functions and take over for what's been missing from the other side of the brain. Now, uh, again, too, because again, left side of the brain controls right side of the body. Right side of the brain controls left side of the body. Um, depending upon how young the patient is, this can really have a better effect as far as the other side of the brain controlling many of the lost functions and the ability to walk and run and do what we need to do. Um, but some people, depending upon how late the surgery is performed on them, um, can have issues with uh, lingering issues. So let me just show you here as far as, uh, so this patient, this patient here, so that's her, the, this is the patient with her mom. And so she's, uh, I think, in her late 20s or so. And so she's living a full life, but she has some lingering issues. And so one of them were, let's see here. So still living with half a brain hasn't been easy, like the small number of others who undergo hemispherectomy. So not all of them, but like the small number. So some, um, Sandhouse, this, the patient, lost motor skills on one side of her body, in her case, the left side. She learned to walk with a brace and she had no use of her left hand and only half of her vision, okay? So, so do you see how, um, you know, removal, depending upon the age and depending upon the patient, um, she can have issues with lingering issues with one side of the body not functioning as well. Although if she's still able to walk with a brace, meaning that um, she's still her, her, the other side of her brain was able to respond in such a way to help recoup some of the uh, loss of function that she had as a result of the uh, removal of the brain. But it helped with and prevented any more seizures from taking place, which the seizures can be debilitating, meaning that you can't do anything in life because every little bit, and then really like not really uh, being able to plan exactly like what goes on with how you're able to react day-to-day -day activities, your activities of what's called daily living, ADLs. Um, so just, you know, doing what you do, have eating breakfast in the morning, um, using the toilet, um, living your life and just doing a job. You know, someone with seizures like this, they can't even do any of those activities easily because of the fact that you don't know when they'll start to seize, when they'll start to just contract and have this uh, electrical storm take place in the side of the brain that we had here as far as the right side that was removed. So this is Rasmussen's syndrome, okay? Or also known as Rasmussen's encephalitis. Excuse me, one moment. Okay. I'm waiting for a phone call, I apologize. I might have to take a pause for a moment. Um, 
during the class here today. So, all right. So, let's go back to our PowerPoint here. So, that's just talking a little bit about the, the cerebral hemispheres as far as when you think of the brain, you think of these cerebral hemispheres, the, the good major portion of the brain. Now, we're going to see here as far as uh, the brain is divided into these three main regions, primary regions, and the cerebrum, cerebral hemispheres, this is what you're thinking about when you think of the brain, called, also called the forebrain, processing of information, right? Taking in input and then sending out output. Afferent information, efferent information. Remember the A-F-F-E-R-E-N-T, the E-F-F-E-R-E-N-T? This is what the forebrain will actually be the processing of this information. The hindbrain, the medulla oblongata, um, you think of the um, really the portion right above the spinal cord. So the, the spinal cord is the extension of uh, the brain stem, the medulla oblongata. We also have the cerebellum. This would be at the, the base of the skull. When you, if you put your hand behind the back of your head, you're, you're, palp you're really feeling the bone, which is called the occiput. And deep to that would be the occipital lobe. And then also inferior to that would be the cerebellum. And the cerebellum, voluntary movements, this ability to maintain, um, uh, you, you're able to walk right, without tipping over and falling, cerebellum is a, has a good portion of that ability to be able to do that. When you drink alcohol or you take any type of medication that might make you uh, high and, and affect your ability to like really be clear, um, cerebellum gets temporarily damaged and, and insulted as a result of that. And so this is why, so someone is, is drunk, intoxicated, uh, they ask them, you know, hey, walk a straight line. They really have a difficulty with that because the cerebellum has been um, affected by the alcohol. Your medulla oblongata, your breathing uh, rhythm, your heart rate, heartbeat strength, um, your blood pressure, your heart rate, these are all controlled. The major uh, important um, really functions that control your ability to live, the medulla oblongata, very important aspect of the, the hindbrain, the brainstem. Right? And then the midbrain, this is really what's actually the, the medulla oblongata and then going more closer to information at this afferent, A-F-F-E-R-E-N-T, information coming up to the cerebral hemispheres. It's by via this midbrain, okay? Uh, and really very important as far as these uh, cerebral peduncles and the, the pons and such will relay information uh, to uh, the actual cerebral hemispheres, the cerebrum. And so, what am I? What are we talking about here? Yeah, let's let's look here, right? This image right here, and then we'll go back to the other PowerPoint image. So you're looking at here's the spinal cord, here's the medulla oblongata, the pons, the cerebral peduncles. Um, here's the cerebellum, um, and we're talking about as far as the cerebral hemispheres here. And so we have here, as far as then, the hindbrain, the midbrain, and the forebrain. So the hindbrain, the midbrain, and the forebrain as far as structures are concerned. But when you're thinking of the cerebral hemispheres in the brain, that's what you're thinking of, this forebrain, this cerebrum, okay? And again, too, this information is going from the spinal cord and it's entering in up into the brain. So we're receiving information, this afferent information from the spinal cord, right? And it's passing through and then going to the cerebral hemispheres for processing. And then we're gonna have output, which will pass through, right? And then go through the spinal cord and then go out to the spinal nerves or to the cranial nerves, and then have some type of reaction taking place, okay? Now, as far as um, protective structures are concerned, so there are these, what are called meninges, okay? You might've heard the term uh, dura mater, right? Uh, the dura mater is the actual outer connective tissue covering of the brain. Okay? Um, this, it, it, the, the literal translation is tough mother, and it just means that it's a very uh, tough and durable connective tissue that will help to uh, protect the brain and keep the cerebral spinal fluid uh, present within. So it's not only just the dura, but it's more of the inner layers of the, uh, of the meninges there. Well, Cows will hold onto this fluid, which will help to uh, bathe and protect um, and also nourish 
uh, the brain and the, the, the cerebral, the central nervous system um, structures. Uh, this tissue, this right here is called the blood brain barrier. Uh, this helps to protect you from any type of um, possible infections that could take place as a result of the interaction between the um, blood and the actual brain itself. Okay, so there's special protection present and special um, safeguards set up to prevent the brain from having direct contact with uh, different pathogens that could make you very sick. So yes, you can get um, different types of encephalitis and different types of infections that affect the brain, but really um, they're far and few between in comparison to uh, infections that you would get throughout the rest of your body or the risk of infections from the rest of your body. You'll see here water and lipid soluble substances can cross the barrier freely, but anything else really uh, that could quite possibly make you sick is really, uh, there's a barrier present there and it helps to protect you. You'll see here as far as in the, the uh, blue, so this, this light blue here and such, and so you'll see as far as their space is concerned, as far as these uh, ventricular spaces, these ventricles, they're present here and here, and there's two, there's passages that go from the brain to the spinal cord and pass through the spinal cord and around the spinal cord. Um, so your, your whole central nervous system, the brain and spinal cord, have this fluid present and it's very important. And you'll see here that there are these coverings. The dura mater is directly connected to and covering and having interaction with of the, the skull, your skull bone, right? And then we have here the arachnoid and the pia. These are just layers, right, that are present that will really act as multiple layers to contain uh, the cerebral spinal fluid and also to protect what takes place as far as the, the central nervous system is concerned. That's simple enough as that is concerned. Um, see here as far as the uh, cortex, now actually let me do this for a moment. Okay, so, so I've tried to um, not go fast, but give you information and, and try to give you some additional information to make it interesting as far as uh, discussing certain uh, pathologies, certain illnesses as far as uh, multiple sclerosis and uh, Guillain-Barre and uh, Rasmussen syndrome. Um, are there any questions so far as we're, as we're going through this? Again, neurology, study of the nervous system, it's challenging. It's not easy, to be honest. Um, but, you know, just trying to uh, make sure that I give you information that can help you to understand it a bit and also um, show you the different illnesses. And you might even know, you know, family members or friends uh, that might have suffered from these or just people that you know in particular, or, or at your job, if you work in healthcare and such, um, you know, even though not working with patients per se, maybe, I don't know, whatever it is that you do, you, you come in contact with people who um, do suffer with different illnesses. And so these illnesses might be familiar to you or not. Um, let me have, ask you, um, anybody ever uh, come in contact with uh, a person who's suffered with any of these illnesses that you know of in particular, or any other type of uh, neurological, nerve type, nervous system type um, illness? Anyone in particular or any? Have you, have you heard of these? Uh, Go ahead. So, so my grandma, she didn't have one of these, but like, uh, she like broke her wrist from falling down the stairs and the surgeon had to like reconstruct like all her stuff or else she wouldn't have been able to move her hand. So yeah. that was like nerves type stuff. Yeah. That, that, you're right. That's right. Absolutely. And so, and that's a big deal because, you know, having, having the ability to control your fingers and do the, the do the different tasks that we need to do on a daily basis, man. If you don't have that, if you, if you, so I fractured my left wrist when I was a kid, when I was like 13 and a teenager and uh, boy, that was difficult, right? It's left side. So I, I'm, I'm right hand dominant. So that was okay, but still not being able to move one hand. So imagine if it is your, your dominant hand um, and even not, I mean, we still, I'm always doing things with both, both hands and such. And that's a, that's really a major issue for sure. And how about even 
and, and Dylan, how is she doing as of now? Uh, she's good. Uh, that happened like two years ago, but she there was a while where she really couldn't do much with it. So yeah. she's good now, yeah. Oh, I'm glad. That's good. Yeah, I mean, how about patients who suffer from what's called carpal tunnel syndrome, right? Where they actually have, so they didn't, they didn't damage anything particular by say like a, a major injury, but say they're they're doing a repetitive type movement or they're working on the computer for long periods of time or they're whatever they're doing, they're doing a repetitive type work and it, it causes impingement, compression of the area in the wrist where nerves are passing through and it can cause all kinds of pain and discomfort. And so even if there's no fracture per se or no, uh, you know, damage per se, as far as as a result of a crushing type injury or that still very uncomfortable. Anybody ever experience anything along those lines? Let me see, Gabriella, I'll read your, I had that in my wrist a few years ago, had to wear a brace. Yeah, Gabriella, that's really painful and uncomfortable. And yeah, bracing can help, absolutely, to, to allow for the inflammation to calm down and such. Um, yeah, it's tough stuff for sure. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, thank you guys for sharing. So very good. So let's go back to the PowerPoint and we'll, uh, we'll finish up. Let me hide everyone. Okay. So the cortex is really that outer portion of the cerebral hemisphere, okay? Um, the, we, you see here it says, uh, this is the area where a lot of like who you are as a person is really where what like is really what you are as far as like the the person that you are the thoughts that you have um, your your cortex right conscious thought your capacity for language um, your emotional responses and memories this is all a part of the cerebral hemispheres and in particular more of the frontal uh, portion the frontal lobe of the brain of the cerebral hemispheres and in particular the cortical region the outer part of that cerebral hemisphere um, there are areas for uh, control of motor activities so control of the muscular system uh, sensory areas for the receiving of information from the receptors throughout the body and then these association areas that work in conjunction with these specific areas in order to help them to do their jobs and then we also have uh, what's called the emotional brain, the limbic system, which can, which is comprises of many of the inner workings, the inner uh, anatomical structures of the brain itself. Um, and really, and this is quite interesting in that, uh, and working also with the frontal lobe, that who you are, right? It's it's a matter of how you respond to the different stimuli that come at you from day to day. Um, and and how you react and how your personality and and how your th how you think and how you react and how you speak and all of this the limbic system contributes to what's taking place in the cortex as far as how and, and your frontal lobe and how you behave throughout the day very complex to be honest uh, your consciousness right so the state of you being alert and awake right um, in in regards to then like in comparison to um when you're sleeping where you're you're in a state of semi-consciousness right you're you're unconscious but you still can be woken up right so you could you can be startled you can be woken up um unfortunately uh i i at times can react kind of like huh, uh, when things go on and i've scared my wife a few times over the years from her just like by accident she'll turn a light on in the bedroom and and I'm sleeping and I wake up and I'm like, ah, you know, I go, what are you doing? <laughs> um, and, but in the case of say like a, a coma, the patient cannot be, um, you, you can't use like any type of stimulation, like a pinprick or shaking them. They won't wake up from that. And that's a, more of a deepest, deeper state of unconsciousness. And there's this uh, part of the brain called the reticular formation that has control over this. Um, your sleep-wake cycle and your ability to sleep um, also very much controlled by the aspects of the brain and, and in particular, so think about this for a moment. How many of you have heard of um, something called melatonin? Melatonin, it's a hormone 
And what you can actually take melatonin if you're having issues with going to sleep or having issues with becoming, uh, getting, um, getting a restful sleep. Um, that can be a natural aid to help. And uh, what goes on with that is that your body actually, in what's called the pineal gland, uh, produces melatonin when it gets dark outside. So when it starts getting dark outside, your body will kick out this melatonin, which will act to kind of chill you out and calm you down a bit and get you really ready for, for sleep. Um, so it's a nat, we, we produce this, but some of us have issues with producing uh, enough of it to make us uh, sleepy. So taking uh, melatonin can contribute to that. And, and know that as far as sleep is concerned, so there are different aspects of sleep, but know that if you don't get your proper sleep, this can affect you in day-to-day -day functioning. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna bring you all out for a moment here again. Okay, so how many of you have had issues where you, you didn't get enough sleep? And describe for me how you felt the next day, please. Somebody, somebody you know, open up a mic and uh, say something, please. You didn't get enough sleep the night before or a couple nights before, and then the following day and days, how did you feel? Um, so the other day, like uh, I ended up falling asleep around like four or five o'clock. Uh -huh. um, it, it just was one of those nights. And um, that was about a day or two ago. And then last night, or all day yesterday, I, I was kind of groggy. And then today, last uh, last night, sorry, um, is when I got like nine hours of sleep because I was able to fall asleep early. Okay, yeah. So, yeah. But, but, but you didn't get that sleep before. And man, you didn't feel good. You felt quote unquote groggy, right? Good, mm -hmm. Andrew. Thank, thank you, Aiden. Andrew, what do you? What, what, give me some input there. Thank so you. So over the summer, I went to the beach, and I'm a type of person that needs to wear like an ample amount of sunscreen. I get burnt easily. Understood. And I got a really bad burn. And mm -hmm. what followed after the first two days was what we call hell's itch. So it's like where all the nerves, I guess, are like really stimulated and it does not stop itching. It's an incessant fucking itch. I'm sorry. Oh, it's just yeah. such a bad memory. Yeah, I just think that's terrible. Seriously, it's um, terrible. And yeah, for like three nights in a row, I just could not sleep. I, I couldn't sleep. Wow. It was, I was so groggy. I was just so out of whack. Oh my gosh. You're not, it was the you're worst. Not yourself. No, absolutely no. not. And the one it finally like relaxed like finally got to the point where i could sleep i think i slept like 14 hours man like yes right I'm sure. yeah because your body's just like enough i'm exhausted well thank you andrew um then we also have let's see here as far as um, yeah let's see hunter wanting to sleep more in the day yeah because yeah so there, there's issues as far as with um not getting enough sleep the night before or the nights before and then really afterwards you're like you're craving sleep as you're saying there so i worked the night shift when i was in graduate school the latter part of my work in graduate school right um and what would happen would be that you would i would crave sleep so come like three o'clock between three o'clock and five o'clock in the morning was the tip, worst time so i would take my my lunch break then i would lay on a table Right. And I cleaned it off afterwards, but I'd lay on a table and I would just like have my alarm clock there and I would sleep for my half hour break. And it was just like it was like you craved like a drug. Really, that's what it was like when I wasn't getting enough sleep. And so and what happened, folks, is that it really does affect you as far as how you cognitively respond to things in life. Right. Just just how you how you live your life. You, you're having this groggy state, this like unclear right uh state where um th it's been described as those who are driving without enough sleep as they are intoxicated because their reaction time is pretty much very comparable to those that are under the influence of some type of medication or or drug or um or alcohol people who don't get enough sleep same kind of a thing folks so so know that if you're not getting enough sleep and you're getting out getting behind the vehicle getting behind the wheel of a car and driving please my gosh be careful or don't do it at all um you need to get your proper sleep know this that when you're not getting enough sleep 
the cerebral spinal fluid that's present within your brain isn't able to flow through the brain and remove any types of uh, products of your brain working. There's waste products that are produced. If it can't clear those out while you're sleeping, um, then they're then they're left there, and it's going to affect your cognitive ability, your ability to think clearly, and that's a problem. So yeah, so I have to tell you that also they're doing studies that are that they're trying to show the relationship between um, Alzheimer's, different types of dementia, and the fact that we're not getting proper sleep throughout the life of of of, of your life, and uh, chronic issues with sleep can really affect how you think. So keep that in mind, folks, please. Very important to get, your good, get a good night's sleep on a regular basis. Okay, so let's move on. So that, okay, as far as memory is concerned, so memory is, is quite an interesting thing, to be honest. And I, I don't know if any of you know of anybody who, um, has like a photographic memory. Um, I I have met people in the past in graduate school and in my career in college and such, um, a few people that have had like this photographic memory and it's just like, it blows your mind. I don't know how, you know, they're just, they're, they're able to do this. Really the majority of us have to work very hard and do a lot of repetition in order to remember information and such. And so re repeating and and using your different senses as far as your hearing, your sight, um, your speech, your writing, like taking notes, these are all very important in order to help um, us create long-term memory. Short-term memory, not a big deal. We, we, we can memorize things for, on the short term, um, but then really they don't stick with us. But the long-term and helping to really hold on to information that we wanna learn. So like in the case of when I'm teaching, um, my anatomy students, right? They're going for careers in healthcare. And so they're gonna be working with patients, humans. So they need to not only just learn the information that they're learning for that class that I'm teaching, but also just for their job. When someone is a mechanic and they're working on cars, they learn the parts of the cars and how they work. They don't just learn it once and then, oh, I'm good, but they have to learn it so that they can use it in the job and in the career that they've chosen. So creating long-term memories, uh, is a challenge indeed, but you can do it and you can become better at it. I am so much better at memorizing information now than I was many years ago. And, you know, it's just a matter of that. It's a learned behavior and it's something that you develop over long periods of time, but you can become much better at memory skills and, and retaining information the more you practice it and the more you do it. And know this, that really cramming information Cramming information, like, you know, the night before a test, you know, trying to stimulate the short-term memory, it's not going to do it. It's not going to, you can, you can remember certain things, but really for the long-term and, and, and really helping you as far as doing well in a test, it's really a difficult thing for sure. Amnesia here we have as far as the loss of, of memory and such, this can be very challenging for family members when a patient um, has suffered some type of traumatic brain injury, and they, they maybe temporarily or permanently lose a memory of who their family members are or of how to do certain things. Um, now, you'll see here as far as um, there's declarative memory, there's skill memory, there, these are different types of memory um, and ways of learning information and skill sets and such and, and how to procedures, how to do things. Um, so there are different types of memories that we have, right? Like if you've been playing basketball for many years and you just get a, someone throws you a basketball and you're by a, a hoop and you just, you know, you just throw it. You didn't just think about, oh, I need to do this, this and this and boom. No, you just pick it up and you just do it. And that's as a result of doing that, uh, that type of skill uh, over and over, over a long period of time. Playing the piano someone has learned how to play the piano. My wife worked in nursing homes for many years and she would um, put a patient who really like couldn't have much of a conversation with you. But if she put them sitting in front of the piano, they would put their hands on the piano and all of a sudden they start playing tunes from memory, start playing tunes from memory. And it's just like, whoa, they can't have a conversation with me yet. 
by putting them in front of the piano, it stimulates a portion of their memory that they're able to re recall how to do this type of uh, uh, skill. Pretty, pretty amazing. So you'll see here as far as uh, I'm not asking you to, to memorize this, but just realize that. So we'll have sensory stimuli as from the nose, eyes, and ears. Um, we'll then send information to the cortex. Um, input can be forgotten or input can be going into the short-term memory. And then you'll see here as far as emotional state, having time to repeat or rehearse. So that repetition, uh, the input, associating the input with stored categories of memory influence uh, transferred to long-term storage. So know that we can think of, so I, I'm thinking of a, a couple that we know from our church, right? And I know their names because I've kind of associated their names with something that helped me to remember who they were. So now every time I see them, I can say their names and I know who they are. But it, it took me a while in order to develop this ability to connect them with something that helped me to remember who their names were and create that long-term memory. Know this also that um, we can have different other types of stimuli like say like um, your sense of smell can also stimulate memories. Have you ever had this where you you smelled something you're like hmm, that's a good memory or that's not a good memory right? Um, in the case of like a skunk smell I you only have to do is smell a bad smell like a skunk and for me that creates like not only just a response of Oh, that does smells pretty bad. But it's like, oh, that smells terrible. You know, like because there's there's emotional context and it's connected to that limbic system, that emotional brain, your sense of smell. All right. As far as uh, other um, illnesses and disorders of the nervous system, so we're looking at here as far as concussions, and so we can have uh, mild, moderate, severe type concussions, and these are um, traumatic brain injuries, TBIs. Um, and we know that these can also uh, really be cumulative as far as, uh, and we've they've been doing research on this and showing how, you know, contact sports and such, there needs to be proper protection and, and uh, because these concussions, these uh, even just a mild concussion can have a cumulative effect of damaging the brain. Um, paralysis and having issues where we're not having control over a different aspect of the body uh, can be very, um, extremely, you know, just really affecting the ability for a patient to to live their life and to have their activities of daily living um, in, a, in a normal, healthy way. Um, but people can overcome these illnesses, these issues as far as paralysis. And so maybe they don't get, they, they're not able to actually have the function of whatever part of their body is not functioning. It can still live a, a, a very healthy and um, relatively um, uh, normal life in spite of the issues that can maybe cause them to have trouble walking, trouble moving. Epilepsy and other types of seizure disorders we talked about. Uh, Parkinson's disease where there's actual uh, destruction of the neurons and affecting of the patients will have issues with uh, their cognitive ability, uh, their ability to move, their ability to have tremors, um, a lot of different things can take place with Parkinson's where it can lead to someone's death, but it's more of a slow progressive type illness for most patients. Um, and really, uh, really the difficult illness to deal with. Uh, Alzheimer's disease, also this progressive degeneration of the neurons. And, uh, and like I said before, there's uh, research being done and trying to correlate between um, issues with removal of waste products that have been produced throughout the day and not cleared out. Um, this buildup of these waste products can quite possibly lead to uh, Alzheimer's dementia and other dementias. Uh, meningitis, where we have have actually uh, had um, issues where there is an infection of the brain coverings and um, inflammation of the brain encephalitis. So I mentioned you that Rasmussen's um, syndrome. It's also called Rasmussen's encephalitis, and so issues with uh, brain inflammation. Um, glial cancers would be uh, cancers that develop tumors within the support cells of the um, the nervous system. Okay, in particular the uh, the central and um, central nervous system, as far as the brain and spinal cord. Now, multiple sclerosis, Guillain-Barré. I talked to you about this already. I didn't mention to you that Guillain-Barré could quite possibly be. It's also autoimmune, and it can also uh, 
be as triggered by a viral or bacterial infection, and many times it's temporary. So you can recuperate from Guillain-Barre, multiple sclerosis, there's no cure. Headaches are another issue that many uh, people suffer from, and there can be many different types of etiologies, uh, causes of these types of uh, uh, headaches, and can be really, really uh, destructive and very, um, really affect your ability to live life uh, on a regular basis because they can just totally lay you out where you have to just go lay down because you can't do anything as a result of the pain in your head. And like I said, many different types of uh, etiologies and causes. As far as affecting your mood and such, so this is also um, an issue where um, the brain, not only just having this ability to control what goes on as far as how you do what you do, but also how you think, right? And so um, these can be uh, inherited. They can be, there can be some type of trigger that can cause them. Um, you know, but again, too, it's something that many these patients are not, they're not doing something on purpose because they really want to, but because of what's going on with in their brain that's causing them to think in such a way that's distorted. And um, and I have a, a cousin who has since uh, passed away a few years ago that was, uh, has suffered with schizophrenia and uh, very, very sad. And just uh, to see um, my cousin go from the young man that I knew as we were growing up um, to a young adult who would end up getting married, um, end up getting divorced, and his just his uh, whole um, life spiraled out of control once the schizophrenia took control of his life. And uh, I have to tell you, it's devastating and very sad. You know, so delusions, auditory, uh, hallucinations. So, so things that are not really there, they're, they're thinking that someone is saying something to them or they see something and it's just uh, really a very um, twisted way of looking at life and it's just extremely sad. And you'll see here as far as uh, interesting, as far as um, the diagnostic equipment that we use in order to determine what's going on with the brain and such. And, and so these functional MRIs are revealing how brain activity uh, is going on by uh, looking at uh, it's going taking place as far as when we're thinking certain things and and um, and watching the bl blood flow flowing through the brain and seeing how reaction what will take place as far as the brain activity is concerned. Um, these brain banks banks are actually for the study of patients who have had different types of illnesses and brain injury and how we can study them and try to determine what it is that we might be able to do better for patients now currently suffering from uh, different types of illnesses and uh, brain injury and such. And you'll see here as far as EEG and PET scans, um, also uh, types of imaging as well as types of electrical activity uh, diagnostic tools in order to determine what's taking place with while we're sleeping, um, how about just while we're alert and while we're uh, the brain is functioning, what's going on as far as are there issues with certain areas of the brain not functioning uh, normally. And you'll see here as far as, uh, sadly, as far as with uh, mind-altering drugs and such. So um, how the brain can be hijacked via certain medications and such that can block. Um, so you'll see here as far as morphine and heroin, having the ability to block pain signals and really um, taking over the brain so that you, as far as the body is concerned, as far as the brain is controlling the body, will do all that it takes in order to get that drug, get that 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 uh, drink in order to do what you need to do in order to satisfy uh, that desire that's that's like incessant present within the brain. Uh, I have a, a grandfather who has since passed away many years ago who was an alcoholic for over 50 years and uh, and really just uh, he had a sad life, you know, as a young man and then um, just going to alcohol to try and fix his problems and how that was destructive throughout the family and such was very, very sad. Um, so, uh, Caffeine and nicotine, as far as uh, these are also, you know, they're, they're still, it's a drug. It still can be, a, it's a stimulant. It can affect us. And I think we are all uh, guilty at some point or another from, you know, wanting to have a little bit of, I need a coffee in order to be more alert in the morning, that kind of a thing, right? 
Um, so this is interesting right up here, and I want to go through as far as psychoactive substances, right? These can affect how we think, right? These substances can bind to neuron receptors in the brain, and they can either block or open uh, different areas and uh, that are these receptors are present in order to allow for different chemicals to be released or not released and affect how we think. Um, neurons send and receive altered messages and some affect the pleasure center in the brain, which can stimulate, oh, this is a good feeling. And so I want to get this drug because I want to continually feel this feeling. Or in the case of alcohol, I want to not think about this type of a situation and other types of also um, pharmaceuticals and, and drugs that can affect us, like to, to mellow us out so that we're not thinking about our problems per se. And last slide here. As far as so as far as homeostasis is concerned, so know that and after we look at the special senses, your sense of vision, your sense of smell, your sense of hearing, right? Um, we'll also be talking about the endocrine system next. The following chapter after that, and this is the chap. This is the system that works to release chemicals. So, say like testosterone, um, estrogen. These are types of hormones. Uh, thyroid hormone, right? Uh, these are hormones. These are chemical messages, messengers that are be sending out that are sent out to the body from different areas. They're produced and creating some type of reaction and control over how the body maintains this stable environment within, no matter what's going on outside of the body. All right, so let me now um, stop sharing my screen, bringing everybody out, but I'm going to talk to you a little bit about this uh, this uh, Thursday as far as uh, what's going to take place regarding um, the lab quiz. Okay, so the lab quiz. So I will uh, share, let me, oh, you know, let me do this. Let me share my screen with you again because I want to show you where on the website. Where on the website we have the information that you'll need to access. So let's do here. Just take me a moment. Okay, so log in. All right, so let's let's do it in your your view, student view. And so what you'll do, folks, is you'll go to let's see, documents and resources, and you'll see here in unit one, actually unit two, yeah, unit two. So you see here where it says Word Bank. So you'll click on that. Okay. This is prior to class. So prior to class, I'd like you to print these out for me, please. So prior to class, you have the word bank here. These are all the, the answers to the to the test. Okay. So you'll click, you'll so you click on word bank, you'll you'll print that out. Answer sheet for lab quiz one. So you'll print this out also. So enable editing, then you'll be able to print it. And you will you'll just we'll change the uh, change the date there, okay? And then you'll have these questions. So we're going to do between 25 and 30 questions. Okay, between 25, I, I'm leaning more towards usually like 25 questions. Okay, for your uh, lab quiz. All right, but you'll have your word bank here that you'll be able to use. So you'll have that next to you as a result, and also the uh, answer sheet. And then what you'll do is I will create in coursework. So I'll create a uh, a lab quiz. Yeah, I don't have it yet there. So I'll create a lab quiz part in uh, unit one uh, for, it, it'll be a, where you can upload your answer sheet, okay? So after the quiz is done, so during the quiz, during the quiz, I'll just show you. So let me just pick, I'm just picking this out. It's not what you're gonna be tested on, but so here's just an image, right? And it would be a blank image, except, you know, there'd be no labeling. And I'd say, all right, what is this structure right here? And then for number one, question number one, what is this structure? And so then you'd have to be able to look, you know, off the top of your head and using your word bank, determine, oh, this is the uh, left pulmonary artery. You understand what I'm saying? All right, so that's this is what would be expected of you. That's how I would do the quiz, uh, the lab quiz, and we would go 
through all 25, and then I'd go back and answer any questions if you had any questions regarding, oh, can we look at number one again, or can we look at, I'd probably just go through it one full time again, all right? Um, but that's how it would be. And like I said, you would have your uh, answer sheet, you would have your word bank there with you. Once we're done with the uh, with the test, you would either scan and send it to me via the upload, or you would take a picture with your phone and then send it to me, uh, to put it in via the upload, or if you have an issue where you're not able to upload it, you should be able to upload it. But if you can't, then you can send it to me via email. But I prefer not being sent by email. I prefer it being uploaded. Um, but if, like I said, if there's an issue and you're having trouble, then send it to me by email, but I prefer it not to be sent by email. I prefer it to be uploaded, okay? So, so that's, that's what it looks like as far as, um, Thursday there, that's what's going to happen. I'll also have work for you to do as far as lab work. That I'll give you an assignment, uh, but I'll talk to you about that assignment after we do the lab quiz. Okay, so again, 25 questions. And so what I would look at for the lab quiz would be like, we'll probably start, we'll start at like 10 o'clock. We'll start the lab quiz at 10 a.m. We won't start the lab quiz at 9:30. Okay, so 10 a.m. We'll start the lab quiz, and then I'll give you the lab assignment after the lab quiz. Again, there won't be any other uh, chapter test due this week. Okay, it'll be I'll have it due next week there. Okay, this way because you're focusing on the lab quiz for this one. Any questions at all that I can help you with? Or are you okay? Hi, professor. Hey. Um, yes, I just wanted to clarify. So for the lab quiz. Um, it will start at 10. Will we have like a set amount of time to complete the lab quiz after 10 o'clock or is there? No, no. Remember, um, remember it's I'm going to be giving it to you real time. So I'm going to share my screen. You're going to be watch. It's going to be in GoToMeeting. So the lab quiz will be in GoToMeeting. I will share my quiz, my, my, my screen with you all. And I'll show you like I just showed you the image of the heart. I'll show you an image. It won't have any identifiers on it. It might have a number or a letter attached, or it might not, but I'll point to an, an image and I'll say, identify this structure. And then I'll give you a certain period of time in order to do that. Then I'll move on to the next question. So it'll be real time on GoToMeeting. Okay, all right, thank you. Sorry about that. I realized I, I asked oh, no. you that a couple of weeks no, ago. No. So. It's okay, it's all right, yeah. So I wanna make sure that you understand. That That's all good, yeah. All right, yep, thank you then. You're welcome. Sure. Anybody else have any questions? Are we all set? Thank you, John, for your message there. Anybody else have any issues? Are we okay? Do you understand? All right. Very good. Okay, folks. So listen, have a great day. Um, I will see you on Thursday at 10 o'clock and we'll do our lab quiz and then I'll give you your lab assignment afterwards. All right, folks, have a great day. Take care. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Thanks. You too. Also. Bye-bye now. Thank you, take care. Thank you, take care. Okay, very good, okay.